Hi everyone, my name is Ryan Anderson and I'm a Community Program Coordinator for Utah Clean Energy. We're here today to talk about the SCPW Challenge, which is an online platform that you can use to help you reduce your energy use while at home. Most of you probably know this already, but Park City has some of the most ambitious climate goals in the country. We're trying to get to net zero by 2030. But in order to do this, we need all of us on board. Most of you probably didn't know this, but our homes contribute to 30% of our local emissions. That means in order for us to reach community-wide net zero by 2030, we all have to do something at home. So here to talk to you a little bit more about that today are our SCPW's energy ambassadors, Katya and Jackson, and they'll introduce themselves now. Hello, my name is Jackson Crowley. I am a junior at Park City High School, and I'm going to speak to you about the SCPW Challenge site. Hey everyone, I'm Katya and I'm a sophomore at Park City High School. As ambassadors, our goal is to educate and empower our peers to learn about climate change. We're responsible for encouraging students to take action to become more energy efficient and conservative. We're going to show you easy ways to reduce pollution from home and how you can measure your carbon footprint to see your energy savings after you take action. If you're like us, your family has been sitting at home with the lights on, upstairs while I do homework, and downstairs while my mom watches TV. All this extra energy use is increasing our energy bills and our carbon footprint. But there are things we can do to change our habits and save energy. And that's where the SCPW challenge comes in. I'm going to take you to the site now. The SCPW challenge is an online interactive tool that has how-to guides and resources for over 70 actions that you can take in order to reduce your carbon footprint. In light of our current public health crisis, we've set up a special list of actions called hanging out at home that are things you can do without leaving the house. Before we get into specific actions, I'll do a quick walkthrough of the site so you know how to use it. Feel free to follow along and start picking out actions you might want to add to your home energy plan. First, you'll need to create an account at www.scpwchallenge.org. I've already done that, so I'll start walking through the energy profile. This is where you enter all the information about your current habits and can figure out your carbon footprint and how it compares. The first category just speaks about your household, how many people live there, and how big your house is. The next one asks about appliances. If you have a gas stovetop, that can increase your carbon footprint, stuff like that. The next one is very, very similar. It asks about heating and cooling. What kind of fuel do you use? Do you have air conditioning? Things like that. Following this is utility information. Uh, this is a, uh, this asks you to enter your actual data, so we can skip that for now. Next is transportation. This asks how you get around. Do you use a car? Do you carpool? Do you take the bus? Stuff like that. Finally is food waste. This is actually a very large contributor to climate change. You can figure out where you eat in the carbon chain and stuff like that. Now you're ready to look at actions. As I said before, there are over 70 actions on the challenge site. Recently, I completed the installing smart power strips. So to turn that in, I would click here Please go. And I would create a post. Katya, what have you done? One of the actions my family has been focusing on is eating lower down on the carbon chain. We found new recipes using meat substitutes such as chickpeas and vegetarian meat patties. As energy ambassadors, we're sending out a tip every single week on how you can save energy today. This week's tip is composting. My family's planning on starting to compost this summer and we will be tracking our action using the SCPW Challenge site. For those of you who are interested, we have a great video from Utah Clean Energy's office administrator and composting expert, Blair Brown, up next. Thank you so much, Katya and Jackson. As Katya mentioned, Blair Brown is gonna go through a quick tutorial on how to get started composting. And in order to, to stay up to date on the other weekly actions that Katya mentioned, make sure to follow our Facebook page or join the SCBW Challenge to get weekly updates. Thank you so much. 
Hi everyone, my name is Blair Brown and I am the office manager for Utah Clean Energy. Now that we've moved on to composting, let's go back to the challenge site and make sure we take that action. Today I'm going to be teaching you all about how to compost from home as well as how to create your own vermicompost bin using materials you probably already have laying around your house. So let's get started. So what is composting? Composting is the natural process of taking organic material and turning it into a dark, rich substance. That substance is compost. Composting is very beneficial. For one, it allows us to divert waste from our landfills. Our landfills are made up of roughly 30% organic or compostable material. Due to inadequate conditions in the landfill environment, these items will actually give off a very powerful greenhouse gas, which is methane. Methane is roughly 30% more powerful than carbon dioxide. Now your backyard bins or piles will give off some carbon dioxide, but considering that methane is much more powerful, composting in your backyard has a smaller impact than sending that material to the landfill. To put it all into perspective, one head of romaine lettuce can take up to 25 years to decompose in a landfill. Yes, one head of romaine lettuce can take up to 25 years to decompose in a landfill. Now, that same head of romaine lettuce could take roughly a couple of days, maybe a month, either in your vermin compost bin or in your outdoor pile. Compost that you get from composting is also extremely beneficial to your plants. Adding compost to your soils can help soils retain moisture, aerate the soils, introduce beneficial organisms, help your plants fight against infectious diseases, and it provides nutrients for your plants to utilize. Overall, adding compost is a good key element to healthy soils here in Utah. Now let's talk about hot composting. Hot, comp hot composting might be what you typically think of in terms of composting in your backyard. Hot composting basically involves organic matter and heat to break down that organic matter and turn it into usable compost. Now here's a list of what you can compost. You will see that the your kitchen scraps are definitely compostable. One thing just to note is that when you're adding maybe a spoiled apple that you didn't get to, make sure you're removing those uh, stickers from them. You want to make sure whatever you're putting in your compost pile is organic. Um, coffee grounds are great, tea, plant clippings. Just make sure if the plants that you're adding to your pile are not diseased because you'll be, you could potentially introduce those diseases into the compost when it's finished. Then once you go to use it, the disease could infect plants that you're adding it to. Dry leaves, um, nuts excluding walnuts, shredded egg cartons, the ones made out of paper, newspaper. Um, when you're adding paper, just make sure that you're avoiding anything that is shiny or heavily um, dyed or has a lot of ink in it. Twigs, hay. Now here is a list of things that you cannot put in your compost pile. Um, one thing to note, citruses can kind of throw off the pH of your pile and in your vermicompost bins, worms don't really like super acidic things. So you'll want to avoid citrus altogether in your vermicompost bin or in your outdoor pile, you'll just want to make sure you're not adding too much citrus. Um, you don't want any sort of animal byproducts. Um, be careful with non-biodegradable materials, uh, toxic materials that could be fertilizers, anything that's not organic, uh, diseased plants, walnuts. Um, walnuts actually have a toxic are toxic to some plants, so you'll just want to avoid those altogether. Um, onions and vermicomposting, again, they're a little too acidic for the worms. And you'll want to also make sure to avoid adding any weed seeds or seeds from plants that you don't want to potentially pop up once you start using that compost and dairy as well. Let's talk about how to get your outdoor hot compost piles started. First, you'll want to choose a location for your pile. Your pile should be in a location that gets roughly six hours of sunlight a day. 
if you don't have a location available that gets that much sunlight, let's say you have maybe a slightly shadier spot, that's okay. The process from organic material to usable compost will just be much slower. And if you happen to have a location that gets more sunlight that's ready to use, then you'll just have to keep in mind that you might need to add more moisture to your pile and aerate it more often. Now, when you're going to choose a location, you also wanna think about this ideal size of the pile that you'll need to, to create. So that's roughly a three feet by three feet by three feet pile or a five feet by five feet by five feet pile. Now there are uh, structures that you can easily build to kind of contain your pile. I would recommend getting one that has at least two compartments, if not three. You could also go with a four compartment bin. This just allows you to move the, your finished compost to a done pile and get another pile started. Making sure that your pile fits within those size ranges is really helpful for you because having a pile that's too big gets kind of hard to manage or is very labor intensive to manage. So really keep that in mind and really try to stick to those kind of size ranges that I just provided. I get asked this all the time. Do I need to put down a barrier between my pile and the ground? No, you don't. You don't need a layer of plastic. You don't need a layer of rocks, mulch, whatever. You don't need to do that. However, if you do happen to choose a place that might have weed barrier fabric down, rocks, mulch, don't worry about removing it. You can just start your pile right on top of it if you'd like. You'll also want to pick a location that has access to a water source. You'll be adding water to your pile on a consistent basis. Roughly every week to two weeks, you'll need to add some water to it. Um, I highly recommend keeping a water source close to wherever you choose your pile to be, just so you'll keep up with adding water to it. Once you have your location and your structure in place, you'll want to begin by adding a layer of carbon-rich materials to the bottom of your pile. Now you're looking to have roughly three to six inches in height of this layer of carbon-rich material. And carbon-rich materials are often referred to as brown material, brown matter, browns, because in fact, they do typically tend to be brown. And when I'm talking about these things, I'm meaning things like dried brown leaves, cardboard, paper, uh, twigs, sawdust, However, be careful with sawdust because it does tend to compact. So if you're adding sawdust to your compost pile, just make sure you do it in small amounts and really make sure you're mixing it in with other items so that you don't get any sort of compaction. Once you have your layer of carbon rich materials, then you'll want to follow up with a layer of nitrogen rich material. Now nitrogen rich materials are often referred to as greens, green material, green matter, because they're typically green or they come from something that is green. And you'll want to do another three to six inches layer of this material on top of the carbon rich material. And over time, you'll keep these layers going, but you always want to top your nitrogen rich material with another layer of carbon rich material. This kind of just follows the rule of thumb that you always add two parts carbon rich material to one part nitrogen rich material. If you follow that ratio, you will be successful. Once you have your layers of carbon and nitrogen rich materials in place, you want to add some water to the, your pile. And depending on what size pile you've created, you're going to want to add roughly a quarter gallon to a half gallon of water to it. Once you've completed that, now it's a waiting game. In a couple of days, your pile will begin to heat up and become active. If you'd like to keep an eye on the temperature of your pile, you can purchase a compost thermometer and the ideal temperature of your pile is roughly 160 degrees Fahrenheit. To maintain your pile, you're just going to want to keep an eye on it. You will probably want to check in on it every week to two weeks, add more materials to it, and also aerate it. Personally, I like to aerate my pile with a pitchfork, it seems to do the job easiest for me. Uh, you could use a shovel, whatever you have the means to turn it with. And you also want to continue to add water to it. Now, the moisture level that you're looking for is roughly a damp sponge. So imagine a sponge 
that you have just wet and you've wrung it out a little bit and that moisture level, that feeling, that's kind of what you're going for with the materials that are in your pile. Now in six to eight months, you will have usable compost to use in your garden. Now let's talk about vermicomposting. Vermicomposting uses the power of worms to break down organic material. Personally, vermicomposting is one of my favorite ways to recycle my organic waste. That's because the worms do all the work for me. It doesn't take a lot of my time, it's not super labor intensive, and they're just so low maintenance. Honestly, vermicomposting is perfect for people who live in apartments or have small homes, don't have a large yard, or aren't looking for the commitment that a backyard pile takes. Uh, also, creating a vermicompost bin is a great project to do with your kids if you're looking for something to do with them. And also just educate them about food waste and how when our organic waste goes to the landfill that that is maybe not the best way of getting rid of our organic waste. So, vermicomposting typically happens in an enclosed bin. You can use a plastic tub, a five gallon bucket, you could even use a wood crate as long as you lined it with something that wouldn't, would keep the worms and the material inside of it. The only thing that you do want to make sure that you have for your bin is a lid. That is kind of a key component. Um, but don't worry about it matching, honestly, my vermicomposting bins are not anything pretty. Um, but do make sure that the bin is kind of a good structure because you don't want it to kind of crack or break over time. That would just mean that you would have to transfer everything to another bin. So when you first start out, just make sure you get something that's a sturdy structure. So you want to choose the location for your vermicompost bin that is out of any sort of harsh weather conditions. Worms don't really like extreme temperatures. So a great place to put your bin would be in a garage, a shed, a closet, under your kitchen sink even works. Um, uh, you really wanna keep them in an environment that stays between like roughly 36 or 37 degrees Fahrenheit to 80 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, obviously inside the bin will be a little bit cooler because of the insulation of the bin and the matter that's inside of it. But just keep that in mind when you're picking a location for your bin, that is very important. If they freeze or if they get too hot, you won't have an active bin and you might end up needing to get more worms. So where do you get worms? Well, um, you can purchase worms from Uncle Jim's Worm Farm, which is an online website. Uh, I have had other people purchase from them and they are, we were very happy with the worms that they got. You could also look and see if there's anyone on Facebook or on one of the classifieds websites that's maybe giving away some of their worms. I often will give away some of my worms to people who are looking to get more or to start a bin. Um, I, uh, I, when I started, I actually purchased them from someone else who had a vermicompost bin and he was selling them. So there are many places where you can get worms, but I personally haven't seen them at any sort of garden store or um, like a Home Depot or a Lowe's. You'll probably have to look for an individual or something like Uncle Jim's. Now, as far as how many worms to get, so you'll probably want to purchase, depending on what size bin you have, like let's say you have a 15 gallon tote, which is what I personally have. I just have a couple of them. But that to me is like the appropriate size for me and my boyfriend and the waste that we create. So we, so you, we started with roughly, I think it was like a quarter pound or a half pound of worms, which to be honest is not a lot. Um, we probably could have started with a pound of worms and would have been fine. However, worms reproduce really quickly. So if you end up only getting like a quarter pound of worms, don't worry about it. Uh, in a couple of months, you will have probably a full pound of worms um, already ready or going in your bin. It's wild how fast they reproduce. Now that we've kind of talked a little about, bit about vermicomposting, let's go outside and talk about maintaining a vermicompost bin and also how to create one. All right, now 
let's talk about the items that you will need to start your vermicompost bin. So I have my bin. Um, I would like to point out though that this bin is not ideal. The reason why is because it is clear. Worms want to be in a dark, damp space. So having this bin be clear allows too much light to kind of filter into their environment. If you only have one of these bins, um, I would recommend painting the outside of it. Um, don't paint the inside of it, just the outside, uh, and that will solve that issue for you if this is the only kind that you have laying around your house. Um, you will also need a lid for it, um, and for the lid, you'll want to drill holes in the top of it, which later on I'll show you kind of what that looks like. But this bin is actually a um, 66 quart um, or 62 liter bin, which is a great size for a worm bin for a small family or a, an individual or even a couple. It will work just fine. Um, I also have some compost that's already um, ready to be used. Um, we'll add this to add grit to the bedding so that the worms can easily digest the organic matter that we're adding to it. Um, I have water so that we can make sure that the moisture level is correct in the bin. Um, these are my worms. Um, the, I just pulled them out of another bin that I have. Um, they're down in there and maybe when we pull them out and actually add them to the bin you'll get to see some. Um, I have some very moldy um, organic matter just from my kitchen. Um, definitely forgot about those berries in the back of the fridge. That's okay. Um, and I'd like to note that um, moldy food is totally fine. Um, the worms will kind of digest the mold as well. So um, don't worry about if your food's moldy or not. It doesn't really matter. Just make sure that when you do add moldy food to your um, vermicompost bin that you kind of bury it a little bit. Um, I have uh, some shredded paper as well. This paper's a little bit damp. Um, because I was doing something with it earlier and then decided not to use it. But I'm not gonna waste it, I'm gonna use it in this bin. Um, and it's already kind of got some compost um, moved into it as well. And then I have a bucket of already very dry, um, there's some brown leaves in here, some shredded paper. Now with your shredded paper, um, this looks mostly like white paper, um, which is totally fine, but you just want to be careful that you that's not the only thing that you add to your vermicompost bin. And same with your um, outdoor compost pile if you're doing one of those as well. Um, you wanna make sure that you're adding enough brown material to it, meaning brown paper. Um, white paper does the same thing, it is considered a brown, but it, with the inks in it and the fact that white paper is technically bleached, you just don't wanna have an excess amount of it. So let's get started on making a vermicompost bin. So you'll want to start by adding um, a layer of dry um, paper. You can also use dry brown leaves. You could use um, some sawdust, whatever you kind of have that's a brown um, nutrient, you can add that. So this bag is kind of full of brown paper, white paper, shredded. Um, and shredding it instead of adding like whole pieces of paper just makes it easier for the worms to kind of move around um, within the uh, their bedding and it, they'll also break down this paper so um, anything even when you're adding your organic matter to your bin the smaller that you can get it the better it just makes it there um, it makes things a little bit easier on them so this is actually already damp um, it's almost damp enough and I've added compost to it. But just to show you, um, you just wanna sprinkle in some of that compost over your dried uh, paper. If that's what you're using, that's what most people have access to. Um, and just kinda of work it in. And you're looking to have roughly um, three inches of bedding on the bottom. Um, worms tend to live in the top three inches of their bedding in their soil. Um, and I'm just gonna wet this a little bit. So again, you're looking for kind of the consistency of a damp sponge. You don't want it too wet and you don't want it too dry. If either of those conditions happen to you, you'll probably know it because your worms will start to crawl out. Um, so if that happens to you, that is a sign that your bin might be a little bit too 
moist or too dry or you might have added something they don't like to the bin. So things that they don't like typically are uh, super acidic items. So pineapple, citrus, onions, that stuff um, kind of will make them uh, jump ship. <laughs> they do not enjoy those things. So now that I have my bedding down and it's kind of a moist sponge so you can see as I kind of put it in my hand, it kind of sticks together but it still crumbles really easily. So now that that's down, I am going to add my worms. So let's see, there's, there's one. kind of just add them right on top just trying to get some so you could see them they do typically tend to huddle in the bottom just to avoid that light and like I said I pulled these out of my other bin so hopefully you can see some of those um, I'm not grossed out by any of this stuff but if you are feel free to wear gloves if that helps you so they've been added going to add my compost. And once again, I'm not grossed out by mold, so I just use my hands. And you can spread this around the bin if you'd like, whatever is easiest for you. Um, if you, these things, I mean, the sizes of these things are totally fine, but if you wanted things to kind of be faster, you could throw it in a blender um, and blend it up with some water and then pour that in and they would be able to decompose that much faster. Now this is just a, um, a coffee filter and I just kind of tore it up um, and put it in there and they'll work through that and there's also coffee grounds and a tea bag and I'm just going to open that tea bag, throw that in, get the rest of that in there and then I'm just going to add a little bit of water just because um, those coffee grounds and stuff are kind of dry so I'm just going to add a little bit. Perfect. So there's no need to mix it all together. You just throw it on top um, and they'll work through it. Now the final stage is to add a layer of dry brown material to the top. This is what's going to help keep odors away. Um, so I have this bucket and like I said it has some brown leaves in it and stuff so I'm just going to kind of put a layer of that over the top. You're gonna want a decent layer of brown stuff on top. I'm talking like ugh, four to five inches of, brown, of material on top. Making sure it's loose though. Don't push it down and compact it. Um, you don't want any compaction in there. And you're gonna leave this layer dry. You don't want this layer to be super moist. All right, and that is it. That's all it takes to create a worm compost bin or a vermicompost bin. Um, now I would put a lid on this and then I would go store it and come back to it in a week or so and add some more stuff to it. Um, and to add stuff to your worm bin, you want to kind of pull back this dry layer and get down to that more moist layer. And then you can add it right into there. And then once you're done, you'll just cover it back up. Now over time, this top layer is going to kind of decompose. So um, I would say maybe like once a month, every other month, you're gonna wanna kind of replenish this top layer of dry material, just so you're keeping up with keeping those odors away. And again, when I pull this back, it doesn't smell. It just kind of smells earthy. Um, if you do kind of get a smelly bin, it probably means that material isn't deep enough or it's not covered up enough with this dry material on top. Um, one thing to keep in mind is, again, be careful of fruit and vegetable stickers. You really don't want to be introducing those into your, your vermicompost bin. Um, stay away from acidic items. And other than that, you should have a healthy bin. And now I'm going to show you a bin that is actually done and has been going for a little while. This is actually 
Utah Clean Energy's office <laughs> vermicompost bin. We put all of our um, scraps from lunch and things like that into our bin. Um, if it's helpful for you, feel free to create like a little list of what you can and cannot put in here just so your family is aware. And I've done that here um, to kind of help the office keep in mind what can and cannot be put in here. So take the lid off. And as you can see, it looks very much like the bin we just created. Um, and I can dig back a little bit so you can kind of see the bottom of that. And there's a carrot. <laughs> um, so down in here, I'll actually pull out some of the casting materials so you can see that. So as you can see, there's some worms in there. The worms have broken down this organic matter and they've created a casting. And this is the material that you will use for your plants. Um, now you won't get a lot of it. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. If you're trying to do a vermicompost bin in hopes of getting a lot of compost for your vegetable garden beds, um, vermicompost isn't gonna give you that unless somehow you're able to have a gigantic <laughs> vermicompost bin. Um, now let's talk about extracting your castings from your vermicompost bin. So let's say your compost bin is kind of almost full, you're ready to extract from it. There's a couple of different ways that you can go about that. So one of the things that you can do is wait for the worms to kind of decompose pretty much everything that's in your bin and then you will feed them in one corner of your bin. So really make sure it gets there. Wait a couple of days, they will all migrate to that food. And then that means you can go in and kind of push this back and kind of extract everything else around that corner and use it in your house plants and things like that. Another way that you can do it is you can actually dump your vermicompost bin contents out onto a tarp and set a light on top of it and kind of spread it out so it's kind of like a thin maybe like a one to two inch layer and all of the worms will avoid that light by going to the very bottom of that tarp now this is something you probably want to do over the course of like roughly an hour or two um, and then you can kind of work through the the castings and kind of separate it from the worms um, you can also lay them out on that tarp and put food in one area this will maybe make it a little bit longer for them to migrate over um, but they'll migrate over to that food and then you can kind of wipe away the castings as well there's also um, these kind of casting almost like those trays that you use to kind of sift through sand um, to find rocks or shells or um, gold <laughs> you can use one of those as well you'll just want to be careful when you shake it so that you're not hurting the worms um, I'm a big fan of having as little casualties as possible when it comes to our worms <laughs> because I love them they're very fun and they do such a good job at decomposing our organic waste so that's pretty much everything. If you have questions, uh, I am going live uh, today at five o'clock with Swanner Eco Center and Preserve, and I will be answering all of your questions in terms of vermicomposting and composting at home. I hope to see you there.